questions I know you understand. I'm now moving straight on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 13945 in the name of Liz Smith on primary one tests. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. Ready? And I call on Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Conservatives are very pleased to bring this debate to Parliament because we believe it is of crucial educational importance. And I'm sure that that view is shared by every political party in the Chamber. Indeed, I think we could all be accused of irresponsibility if we did not both acknowledge and listen to the arguments that are being put to us by many in the world of education. And, Presiding Officer, I want to be very upfront about our own position on this matter. But before that, may I just comment on one thing? And that is to welcome the comments from the Cabinet Secretary for Education at the weekend when he said that he wanted a fact-based debate. And the comments from the First Minister at last week's First Minister's questions when she said to Willie Rennie that educational concerns about this issue should take precedence over politics. That, Presiding Officer, is what many teachers are hoping for this afternoon, and we intend to examine in detail the educational arguments. Of course. Bruce is, Crawford. The member, is the member then aware that currently 29 councils across Scotland, Scotland carry out P1 assessments? Will she today call for those councils to halt those primary one assessments? Or instead, will she stand accused of breathtaking hypocrisy and doing exactly what she just talked about, cheap political point scoring? Liz Smith. I'm very aware, aware of exactly what councils are saying just now. And it's in some of these very same councils that teachers are speaking out loud and clear about their concerns. And let me be crystal clear as I say, about our position and restate our commitment to rigorous standardised tests in P4, P7 and S3 as a crucial part of improving educational attainment and measuring progress in our schools. Now, I know that some parties disagree with standardised assessments generally, but we support the SNP's arguments about why it's important in educational terms and in terms of accountability. John Swinney, in our view, was absolutely right to look at the trends within recent PISA results and the comment within the OECD report of three years ago, both of which were consistent with the 2014 Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy in terms of drawing his conclusions. There was undoubtedly a very strong argument to deliver better standardised assessment. And he is, I believe, correct to say that it has been too easy for some schools and local authorities to be less than wholly accountable for their educational performance. And so it was right to introduce standardisation, which proves that better accountability. And let me be unequivocal. We said in our manifesto in 2016 that primary one testing was part of that. And we shouldn't have argued otherwise. But it is also a matter, however, it's a matter of public record that during the intervening two years within Parliament, within the media, that we have on several occasions said that we have misgivings about primary one tests in a way, in a way that we do not have for P4, P7 and S3. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Liz Smith has said that uh, the Conservative Party has been supportive, was supportive of P1 assessments in 2016. On the 28th of August 2018, Liz Smith issued these words. The Scottish Conservatives have never been in favour of formal standardised national tests in primary one. Does she recognise why some of us feel the Conservatives are deceiving us on this issue? Liz Smith. I recognise, Mr Swinney, that we made a mistake about primary one. But can I just say to the SNP, this coming from a party that in two programmes for government, 2016 and 2017, who hammered home that there would be an education reform bill yeah. is a bit rich. Yeah. Now, let me, come, let me come to the evidence 
because that's important. And I particularly want to speak about the kindergarten model, which is used in many European countries, several of whom, incidentally, do not have children starting formal education until age seven. A model which was established by Friedrich Fribble and used as the foundation of infant teachers training in Scotland for a long period of time. A time when Scotland was the envy of the world for what it delivered in both primary and secondary education. But just as importantly, that philosophy is wholly in line with the principles of the early years of the Curriculum for Excellence. Just like the Curriculum for Excellence, Fribble has a holistic view of every child as an individual. He believed that they should be nurtured as part of the family and community and that success in education came about with strong links between home and school. That infant classroom was based around structured play, on learning through discovery and through the gifts that he described them. Whether these were counting blocks, laterally Cuisinaire rods, colour balls, sand or clay, whatever materials children used to discover. He did not ask infant teachers to make use of standardised tests or assessments, but instead to be skilled in their own professional judgments, well-informed daily observation about each child, which would then be discussed with each family. And everything about that observation was done to inform and improve their teaching. He believed that testing at that young age could actually prove unhelpful, and more importantly, that the quality of the information gained about the child's progress could be gained by more meaningful approaches. Well, and, and I won't at the moment, if you don't mind. In my own teacher training years, I remember exactly this debate taking place amongst primary teachers. So in refining my own thoughts prior to leading this debate, I looked very carefully at the primary one tests. I looked at the curriculum for excellence in terms of its early years. And I also looked at what Scotland has been doing in the past. And I have to say that the curriculum for excellence in the early years is relatively free of the controversy that has bedeviled the later stages and which were laid bare at the Education Committee this morning. And I spoke to a lot of people who had done that fribble training to ask if there were concerns about the fact that the absence of formal testing, perhaps that meant that too many children with problems were not being identified. Only a few said possibly yes, but for the majority, they said that their specialist training actually allowed them to pick up problems more quickly. And one former teacher who had been head of an infant department told me the best way to decide the answer to this whole question about whether or not to test in P1 was to look at the historical trends in standards in middle and primary years. Because if that fribble system had not been delivering, then basic standards in literacy and numeracy would have suffered in P4 and P7. But they did not. Indeed, Scotland had a really strong set of results and irrespective, incidentally, of social background. And I think at this stage in today's debate, it's important to recognise that the current concerns about the standardised tests are largely concentrated on the primary one age group. Although some critics with whom I profoundly disagree believe that the other standardised tests are wrong, it is primary one on which the focus has fallen and we should be asking ourselves about why that is. Yes, I will. Stuart Seals. Is the member aware that on the 17th of September 2017, Justine Greening announced a mandatory test for preschool children and that was a contract placed with NFER on the 18th of April 2018 to develop a mandatory test for all four-year-olds? Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Stevenson. Yes, I am aware of that. Well, the, 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 this, this same debate, the same debate is happening in England and it's happening in Wales, it's happening in many other places. It's not, it's not unique to Scotland. So, presiding officer, can I just share a few thoughts from a primary teacher who wrote to me earlier this week? Well, she told me that she was worried about this debate in primary one test and the fact that some politicians may be misrepresenting our position. And as an, as an experienced teacher of primary one and primary two, she asked me to look at the debate from the best interests of the child. She said, there have been some very good questions in the new test, but there are others which have undoubtedly created problems and which as a result have been the catalyst for the current complaints. In some of the questions, the language used is not making use of the phonic al alphabet with which children are familiar and they are using names which are sometimes very hard to read. Some questions are too long 
taking up too much time, and there is an overemphasis on data handling within each assessment, for which, and I quote, I can't really understand the purpose. She went on to say that this had led to much discussion in her staff room, ending up with many teachers feeling that there had been insufficient training about how many teachers would be able to participate in these tests, how to interpret them, and that there was too much pressure to complete the assessments in a hurry, which I don't actually think was the Scottish Government's intention. All of this seemed to be very time consuming and not altogether clear in terms of how they will be used to inform their teaching. And it is that point that is very important. Cabinet Secretary. Will she accept that the issues that she is recounting from a primary school teacher, which I think are entirely reasonable issues, are not issues that, are issues that should lead us to the conclusion that we should monitor and consider the contents of the assessments, not halt them, as her motion puts forward? Liz Smith. Uh, uh, no, we disagree with that because I think the time has come because of the evidence that has been piling up over the last two years to call a halt, reconsider the evidence that is very much before us and evaluate what is the best way of progressing primary one pupils. So let me come to some of the concerns about other education professionals. And the Cabinet Secretary knows initially that his economic advisors were included in that group. And again, there are some mixed views, and it would be wrong to suggest otherwise. But there is a common theme coming through what they're saying, whether it's Sue Ellis or Lindsay Patterson or Sue Palmer, all of whom I greatly respect in this debate. Now, they have differing views, but in each case, they are saying one fundamental point. It's not just in terms of being able to measure outcomes, but any form of assessment or test has to be meaningful and it has to ensure that all the teachers who are using that test feel entirely comfortable with what it is that they're being asked to do. And on that last point, it is very clear to me that many prim primary one teachers do not currently feel at all comfortable, and that's why this debate is so important. Because when pressed on some of the concerns about the content of the current P1 test, John Swinney said in August uh, this year, and I quote, if we need to look again and reflect on the feedback to make sure that the guidance is appropriate for the process, then we will do that to guarantee that young people have the type of educational experience we want them to have. Now, I believe that that was a recognition that there were some serious issues to be addressed. He knows, I think, that that is what many teachers want him to do. He knows, too, that the evidence provided about the P1 test, including what the rights of parents are to be confused and muddled, and the point that was made by Lindsay Patterson in his article last week. Presiding officer, the Conservatives have been accused of being interested in nothing other than political opportunism and jumping on a bandwagon. If that were true, if that were true, it would not be possible to find on the record comment from me and several of my colleagues on several occasions in the course of the last two years questioning the educational value of primary one testing. As a party, we continue to have these misgivings we are listening to what is being said by those who are being asked to deliver the test and it is why I am proposing this motion which asks the Scottish Government to stop and think, halt the primary on tests so that we can reconsider the facts before us and the whole approach to evaluating pupil progress in primary one. And on that point, Deputy Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Smith. I call on John Swinney to speak to and move Amendment 13945.1. Cabinet Secretary, please. President Officer, I move the amendment in my name. Um, it is important when we make decisions about the future of our children's education, we have available to us dispassionate expert opinion in helping us to make the correct choices. And I have to say at the outset of this debate, having listened with great care to the words that Liz Smith has shared with us today, and with the degree of respect that Liz Smith knows I have for her, I do not believe we have had the marshalling of expert opinion in the debate that we have had so far. The Scottish Government in 2015 invited the OECD to review Scottish education. In that report, Improving Schools in Scotland, the OECD said this, the light sampling of literacy and numeracy at the national level has not provided sufficient evidence for stakeholders to use in their own evaluative activities or for national agencies to identify with confidence the areas of strength. 
They went on to say, there needs to be a more robust evidence base right across the system, especially about learning outcomes and progress, crucially about progress. That is precisely, that is precisely what the National Improvement Framework and National Standardised Assessment seek to do. And I'll give way to Mr Mundell. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I wonder whether he had time this morning to listen to the comments from Professor Jim Scott, who says that no evidence has been brought forward to support these particular uh, assessments and that we don't know whether they're robust or not. Cabinet Secretary. Well, well uh, of course, well, I've just set out why we need these assessments because the OECD told the OECD, well, I, I'm just, I'm just marshalling that we sought external independent opinion which said that we did not have enough information about learning outcomes and progress. So we have put in place the standardised assessments. Now, how we assess their effectiveness is that we ask our education advisors in Education Scotland to ensure that each level of those assessments is compatible with each level of curriculum for excellence, consistent with the benchmarks which have been signed off by the Chief Inspector of Education and the Chief Examiner to make sure that young people are properly equipped with the ability and the platform to progress in our education system. If Elizabeth before, Hall, forgive before, me for a before we do anything else, Mr. Mundell, you're annoying me by barracking from the fact if you want to do something, you intervene. Sorry, so Secretary. Assessment is an essential part of a good education system. It is an integral part of effective teaching and learning. That was the point made by the President of the Association of Directors of Education in the letter she authored with my officials to directors of education, and I quote A key principle of Scotland's education system is that assessment is for learning. Assessment allows teachers to understand children and young people's progress and to plan the next phase of their learning and teaching. Assessment is therefore a key tool to inform teachers' professional judgment of the needs of the children and young people they are teaching. The Scottish Government and the Association of Directors of Education, and I continue to quote, therefore see the assessments as an integral part of everyday learning for children and young people in P1, P4, P7 and S3 delivered as part of the Education Authority's duty to provide education. The professional judgment of teachers, and this is a point that Liz Smith made, is at the heart of the framework and the standardised assessments that we have put forward, but the, the assessments provide a consistent tool to inform these judgments. Teachers have been using assessments for years to confirm their judgment of children's progress. The vast majority, 29 out of 32 local authorities, were using some form of standardised assessment before the national scheme was introduced. And crucially, the majority were not just assessing P1 children, they were assessing P1 children twice during the year. Uh, of course. Ian Gray. Uh, when he made a statement, I think a couple of weeks ago, I asked Mr Swinney if he knew uh, how many of those local authorities had actually replaced those previously used diagnostic uh, assessments with the new SNSCs. Cabinet Secretary. So, and in some cases, for example, East Renfrewshire, yeah are a long-standing, long-established uh, assessment authority. And what they want to do, and I think this is perfectly reasonable, is to see the consistency between the SNSA and the historic model that they've been using to ensure that they have the consistency in educational information. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable transition point for a local authority to take, but not a long-term point. So there's nothing new about assessments for P1 children. Local authorities, led over the years by the SNP, Labour, the Conservatives and the Liberals have all taken forward such an assessment approach and nobody has objected. And there are sound educational reasons for that, the key one being it is absolutely vital to get as much information as possible on children's achievement as early as possible. Professor Sue Ellis, who was quoted by Liz Smith, said this, we know there is a big difference in children's attainment when they start school. And that difference grows and gets wider as children move through the school system. So we need some way of tracking that and checking it. The standard, uh, of course, yes. Liz Smith. The Cabinet Secretary for giving way. In terms of uh, raising standards across the board, which is what we all want to do, what uh, evidence has the Cabinet Secretary got when he claims with the international me measurements, many of whom are not starting the education until seven years old, these countries are doing exceptionally well by educational standards, better than Scotland. Does that not prove a point? Cabinet Secretary. I think the, the key point goes back to my quote from the OECD at the very beginning of my speech. 
that essentially we don't have enough information about learning outcomes and progress. And for progress to be measured, we have to have an understanding about whether children are acquiring the skills that we expect them to acquire at the early level. Because if they are not, they are at a disadvantage in progressing to the first level, and ultimately that will be compounded, and what that will fuel is what we are trying to erode, which is the attainment gap. So the assessments are essential, because for the first time, teachers are able to use the assessments specifically designed for and aligned to curriculum for excellence, and what I pick up from teachers around the country, and I've picked it up for the last two years, is that teachers are not confident in under curriculum for excellence in the levels that they should be achieving for their young people. Now, it's been strengthened by the benchmarks that I've put in place. But what the standardised assessments do is provide that consistency and compatibility from one authority to another so that we can be assured, wherever a child is walking into a school, that the teaching profession is working to the same standard across the country. Uh, of course, I'll go away. Joanne Lamont. Clarification. Uh, is the data being collected at a national level? Because we've been advised it's not going to be collected at a national level. You now seem to be suggesting it's necessary for it to be collected at a national level in order to identify standards at a national level. I'm Cabinet saying, Secretary. I'm saying nothing of the sort. I'm saying that individual teachers, in working their way through the assessments, will have greater clarity about the the performance of a young person against the standards across the country, the benchmarks, what we expect out of curriculum for excellence, not, a, not the results across the country, but the levels that have been achieved by young people across the country. The assessments are high quality and delivered as part of everyday learning. They provide teachers with a detailed breakdown against core skills, highlighting not, on, highlighting not only where a child may need additional support to achieve the relevant standards, but where a child may be excelling and requiring additional challenge. This is in keeping with the government's twin aims of closing the gap and raising standards. The assessments, crucially, and this relates to one part of Liz Smith's motion, the assessments are designed to fit compatibly with the early level of curriculum for excellence, which is a play-based curriculum. It is therefore only appropriate that a small amount of time, less than an hour in one year on average, is taken to ensure that the play-based learning undertaken by children is equipping them with the core skills we believe they should acquire by the end of P1. Without that assessment, we run the risk that the needs of children may not be effectively served by our education system in progressing onto the first level of CFE. Administered correctly, a child will take part in the assessment as part of their normal classwork, and the assessment will not feel any different to any other task that a child is asked to do. Now, I've dealt so far, presiding officer, with the educational arguments. Let me now turn to some of the political issues at stake here. I acknowledge the long-standing hostility of the Greens and the Liberal Democrats on this question. They are entitled to their view, but I do not share it. I'd point out to them that they are hostile to all standardised assessments, and they're being asked to vote for that in the Conservative motion today. I am, however, today appalled at the Conservative Party. When the First Minister announced national standardised assessment in September 2015, Ruth Davidson responded in the chamber saying this, I am pleased that our repeated and sustained calls for standardised assessments to be introduced in schools have been heeded. The Conservative manifesto in 2016 said the Scottish Government should design the new standardised tests at P1, P4, P7 to fit into international methodologies and claimed credit for the introduction of national <laughs> assessment. This morning, Liz Smith said the Conservatives had changed their mind on P1 assessment. That was not what she said on the 28th of August. That day, Liz Smith said this. The Scottish Conservatives have never been in favour of formal standardised national tests in primary one. That statement is untrue. It demonstrates the deceit at the heart of the Conservative motion today. Last week, last week, Last week, the Conservatives were demanding more school data. This week, they want less. In 2016, the Conservatives supported P1 assessment. Today, they don't. There is only one conclusion to draw. The Conservatives are, po are playing politics with the education of our children, and we will not play along with them. Now, um...
Can I say to can I say to speakers, I've given a little extra time, which also, Ms. Smith, you could have had because we had some time in hand and there was a lot of intervention. So if anybody's wondering why the time has been like that, it's to take account of interventions. And now call Ian Gray, please. Mr. Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me begin uh, by being clear that we on this side of the chamber have no problem with teachers assessing pupils' learning. Indeed, teachers assess pupils' learning every day using a whole variety of techniques and diagnostic methodologies, but above all, by deploying their professional expertise to do so. Secondly, we have no problem with the monitoring of literacy and numeracy standards in our schools. In fact, we encourage it, and not just nationally either. We would like to see Scotland re-enter the Tims and Pearls international comparisons, which we found out last week were ditched for no good educational reason but just to save money. We do, however, have a problem with leak tables and high stakes testing. That's why in government we got rid of it in 2003 and replaced it with the Literacy and Numeracy Survey, which did the job well in a statistically rigorous way accepted by teachers, educationalists and parents alike, uh, and which the Scottish government did not improve as the OECD suggested but rather abolished. No, our problem is with the Scottish Government's national standardised tests because they purport to do both of these things, to inform individual learning and to monitor national standards at the same time with the same test. Now, James Maxton once said of politics... Sure. John Swinney. Uh, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful to Mr Gray for giving way. Um, he, he says that we essentially use the standardised assessments to judge performance across the country. That's not the case. What we use is the information from teacher professional judgment about the, uh, reach, the, the, the achievement of levels by individual pupils. That is what is undertaken. But would Mr Gray accept from me that the surveys that he cites do not give us an insight into individual weakness within the system where if we want to improve outcomes for young people, we need to have that data available to us? We certainly, <coughs> well, the, the survey certainly isn't a diagnostic uh, learning tool and never claimed to be. It's a summative uh, survey tool. And let, let me go into a little detail later on uh, about exactly that. James Maxson once said of politics, if you can't ride two horses at once, you shouldn't be in the circus. But Mr Swinney has failed to ride the two horses of individual diagnostic and national standards testing at once. And that has resulted in the current mess and some farcical moments, frankly, such as Mr Swinney's press release telling us these tests are not tests and we should stop calling them tests uh, on the very day his department released an evaluation of them calling them tests. <laughs> or telling parents who asked if they were compulsory that they are not compulsory, but that those parents have no right to refuse to allow their child to do them. That is a riddle, not an answer. Or yesterday's desperation of Scottish government officials putting MSPs and journalists through a literacy and numeracy test for five-year-olds as if that would prove anything. Now, Mr Swinney has told Parliament clearly that these are diagnostic, and I quote, diagnostic assessments to support learning and teaching. Data will not be published or used for accountability. But the First Minister says something different. She says, as a result of the introduction of standardised assessment and the new way we are monitoring performance, instead of the previous Scottish survey of literacy and numeracy data, we will now have data on every pupil in the country which will allow us to determine progress in reducing the attainment gap. So the First Minister thinks these are statistically valid results to monitor progress nationally, while the Deputy First Minister swears to us that they are not. The truth is that the government has managed to introduce assessments which feel like high stakes tests to teachers and pupils, but don't produce statistically valid comparative measurements, and diagnostic tests which teachers tell us they do not trust to diagnose and have not replaced those tests that they were using, those assessments, sorry, that they were using previously. The Deputy First Minister says that these are not summative assessments against benchmarks with a pass-fail. 
But what we were shown yesterday was the teacher sheet for each pupil, which is a list of curriculum for excellence benchmarks with a ticker across against each one according to whether it was passed or failed. And then with the pupil placed against a national norm. We were shown results being collated at class, school, and local authority level. That looks like summative norm reference testing to me. But to be honest, what I think of the assessments isn't important. What matters is what teachers think of them. Yeah. And those views are very clear, not least, yes, not least from the EIS, who only a few weeks ago, I quote, John Swinney. I'm grateful to, to Mr Gray, forgive me. I, I acknowledge that there are many teachers that don't like the standardised assessments. There are equally many other teachers that do. And the issue was illustrated for me to this morning at the Scottish Learning Festival, where I was open to question from a huge audience of teachers. And in the first group of questions, one teacher made the case for and one teacher made the case against. So there are different opinions. What is important is we have to be equipped with the, the diagnostic ability to support young people. And that's why we have these assessments. Ian Gray. No, Mr Swinney. What is important is when an educational reform is built in, the evidence and the consensus and support of it is built first, before it is introduced, and not after. The EIS, who represent teachers, only a couple of weeks ago reaffirmed their serious concerns over the educational values uh, of the national standardised assessments. They wrote to every member of this parliament to do it. One teacher summed it up to me by saying, I cannot use the data from these tests to support my teaching in any way. And that teacher's view was repeated to Mr Swinney this morning at that very learning festival, wasn't it? But, so these problems and flaws apply to the whole of the Scottish National Standardised Assessments. But more than anywhere, they apply in P1. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, because there are many stories of four and five year olds upset, even to the point of tears, by questions they find incomprehensible or confusing and uh, computer skills they are required and find daunting. Secondly, this has meant that in primary one, far from these assessments being an integral part of everyday teaching, teachers tell us they have lost 30, 40, even 50 hours of valuable teaching time for each of the literacy and numeracy, numeracy tests. But thirdly, and above all, as Liz Smith said, because of the growing evidence that at this early age, play-based learning is the most appropriate and effective approach to education in general and closing the attainment gap in particular. Now, the Deputy First Minister has protested in the past and said again today that in P1 we do have a play-based curriculum. But the experts tell us that we cannot have that and the minister's standardised tests. They are not compatible. So even if the government insists on persisting with these tests further up the school while they try to sort out what they're really supposed to be, at the very least, the very minimum, surely they must listen to the teachers whose professional expertise Mr Swinney claims to hold in high regard and scrap the test in primary one. Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm glad that we have the opportunity this afternoon to debate the issue of standardised assessments after weeks of this debate taking place between those of us who speak on education issues but outside of the Parliament. As the Deputy First Minister made clear, the Scottish Greens have long been clear that we oppose this policy. Uh, what he wasn't clear, uh, correct to say, though, was that in supporting the motion put down in Liz Smith's name, we support standardised assessments. You will not find that phrase in the motion. I'll read the first phrase of it. That the Parliament believes that good quality pupil assessment is an essential component of the drive to raise educational standards in Scotland schools. We agree. We do not believe that that assessment should take place through these formalised standard assessments. There's no contradiction there, and I'll explain why as I go through this. There's been much talk of manifestos. Uh, well, in our 2016 manifesto, a fine read that I'd recommend to the government, uh, we unequivocally opposed the return of standardised assessments, and not just for four- and five-year-olds. We welcome the parliamentary majority which is now formed around this position in regards to the P1 assessments specifically, though. 
The Scottish Government have been keen, including in this debate, to say that the policy is evidence-based. But it's international best practice and evidence that led the Greens to oppose standardised testing in the first place. To tick off one particular cliché of education debates, Finland is one of the undisputed success stories of education reform, turning from mediocre at best in the 80s to a model of excellence from the early 2000s onwards. While there are a range of factors contributing to their success, lower levels of inequality and poverty being the most obvious, uh, they've supported that success in education. Their approach to standardised tests are part of that story, that success story. Finnish education was reformed to allow teachers the freedom to assist pupils based on their own best judgement. Standardised testing was dropped and replaced with an emphasis on continuous and formal assessment of the individual needs of each pupil. Our education committee visited Finland earlier this year. During that visit, I think we were all struck by the culture of trust within their system, particularly trust in classroom teachers, to, with proper resourcing, support and training, come to their own judgments about their own pupils. And this is what we need in Scotland, particularly for children with additional support needs for whom the test caused even more unnecessary anxiety. Well-trained teachers and well-staffed schools are what we need to ensure every additional need is identified and supported. That means reversing the cuts which have seen educational psychologists and the grant associated with studying that course disappear. The reason Finland took the approach they have is that while some standardised assessments may provide some data that can be useful, a criticism that's being levied against these assessments, of course, is they don't provide that. But the very presence of the test and the impact they have on pupil experience and teaching is a net negative. Pupils often react badly to the tests. Some experience anxiety and fear, in others it elicits boredom. And we knew this all already. There were warnings from the Scottish Government's own international advisors before the policy was introduced. Professor Andy Hargreaves, a member of the Government's International Council of Education Experts, highlighted the fear and anxiety that standardised tests cause for pupils. Other academics, the EIS, the experience of individual teachers and pupils have all confirmed this. Now, we've all heard the reports of young children being reduced to the point, of, in some cases, of tears and experiencing huge anxiety over these tests. But teachers are also pressured, whether intentionally or not, to teach to the test. The focus becomes hitting some predefined metric, as Ian Gray explained, regardless of its suitability to the pupil that they know and that they know best. Their own professional judgment of individual pupils, one of the principles underpinning curriculum for excellence, one we all agree on, is undermined by this policy. The Deputy First Minister can give all the assurances he likes on how standardised tests will be used, but the very presence of the assessment creates the pressure to teach to that rather than to emphasise the needs of the individual pupil themselves. Teachers are concerned that the results of assessments far beyond the primary one level will be used by senior management and others to form a judgement on their professional ability as well because the data can be aggregated to a class level. This is what creates the pressure to teach to the test. There are also well-grounded fears that although there's no intention for now to return to league tables, that this sets the groundwork for future league tables and the informal tables may begin to emerge. The presence of standardised tests pushes education to become target-driven at a level abstracted from the needs of individual pupils. This cuts straight to the heart of what we want Scottish education to be. Do we want a culture of repeated formal assessments and pressure heaped on pupils throughout their entire school life? Or a culture of tailored support that recognises the individual capability of students and relies on teachers' professional judgement to foster their learning as Curriculum for Excellence intends? What I find particularly frustrating about the introduction of these standardised tests is all the issues I've highlighted were already well known. As mentioned, members of the government's own International Council of Experts have been at the forefront of some of these criticisms. And I appreciate that there are some experts, including on the government's council, who do support approaches of standardised assessments. The government's already drawn attention to a number of them. I respect their views and I don't doubt for a second their expertise in this field. But the question must be asked, why is the government ignoring the other assembled experts? Why is it ignoring the voices of teachers, of pupils? Why is it ignoring those in Scottish education who are saying there is a problem? Just this morning, our Education Committee heard from Professor Jim Scott, Oliver Mandel's already mentioned it, who said that he'd not seen sufficient evidence that these assessments are beneficial. We also heard from Dr Alan Britton, who said that he's not seen evidence of consultation and consensus building on this policy. That's a polite understatement if I've ever heard one. Teachers, parents, education charities, they've all raised concerns and called for the P1 test to be scrapped. After today's debate, a majority of this parliament can be added to that ever-growing list of those calling for a rethink. While many of us have concerns far beyond primary one assessments, this is what the debate is focused on. And I'd urge the Deputy First Minister to walk back his previously stated intentions to ignore the will of this parliament, 
After the shambles of his education bill, which he'll now attempt to force through the majority of without a parliamentary mandate, Mr Swinney is developing a reputation for casting aside the views of elected members, as well as those of experts, teachers, parents and pupils. That's no way to build a successful system of education. It's certainly not building a consensus. It will result in the opposite of Finland's culture of trust. Today we'll give him an opportunity to take a different tact. For the sake of teachers and pupils who are currently experiencing this failed policy, I really do hope that he'll listen. Tavish Scott. Presiding officer, uh, can I thank Liz Smith for bringing forward this uh, debate today? Indeed, if the Scottish Government had been so sure of its grounds, it could have brought forward uh, this debate in, at any point in the last number of weeks. And then, in fairness, Mr Swinney wouldn't have had to miss the Learning Festival this afternoon. They may want to uh, reflect on the benefits of actually leading the debate where they're so mm -hmm. confident of the arguments they want to make. Uh, a retired uh, Edinburgh teacher I know uh, now provides support to local schools here in the capital, paid for through the government's education fund, uh, attainment fund. Uh, in the last year, she has spent more time helping five-year-old girls and boys sit their primary one test than on the job she was employed by the city council to do. On Monday, I sat down with local primary one teachers uh, at home, and they sh showed me the reality of these tests for five-year-olds. Uh, I completely concur with Ian Gray's assessment of what uh, data is produced. The children, the names, the numbering, the questions, uh, the ticks or crosses, and the data that can be produced uh, from that. The simple message from those teachers, they learn nothing about pupils that they do not already know. Uh, as others have mentioned already this morning, uh, this afternoon, uh, two eminent educational researchers told Parliament's Education Committee today that they did not recognise evidence, nor consultation, nor any consensus building for primary one testing. Nor, they pointed out, had the government followed a reasonable principle and piloted such an initi initiative to judge its effectiveness. Now, the principle I share with most teachers and parents is that four and five-year-old girls and boys should encounter a play-based approach to the start of school. Curriculum for Excellence Early Level for three to six-year-olds stresses exploration and play. Yet teachers explain that primary one tests skew learning away from play. And I therefore don't recognize or agree with the Deputy First Minister's interpretation of that in his remarks earlier on. There is a wider debate too about why Scotland persists with the age of five being the formal start to education. Many countries around the world, 88% indeed, structure a play-based nursery or preschool curriculum through to six years old. Some countries start formal education at seven. So, yes, of course. John Mason. Is his argument that, agree, given that we're uh, emphasising play, that play itself should not be assessed? Uh, the, Tavish uh, Scott. Uh, Mr Mason would do well to read the Curriculum for Excellence guidelines in the uh, three to six year old programme uh, and he would understand the answer to that question before he needs to uh, ask it. Uh, teachers assess, nursery teachers assess uh, all the time. Uh, that is the point of this and I don't understand frankly why uh, members on those benches don't get that point. Uh, what is the reality of testing? Rather than a civil service tutorial yesterday, I have listened, and I'm sure I'm not the only uh, opposition member, I have listened not just in this past week, but for weeks and weeks over months to primary one teachers and school management teams about the reality of testing. There is a balance to the argument. The former standardized assessment was, for some teachers, a genuine diagnosis. But teachers have graphically explained that what went before is quite different from the new national standardized tests now in classrooms. And to suggest otherwise is simply misleading. The parents group Upstart also contends that local authority baseline testing is partly responsible for the lack of play-based teaching in many schools. The structure of these tests assume five-year-old girls and boys can read, use a mouse, have an attention span that will last the length of the test, and will not simply guess the answer, wrong on all counts, as many teachers observe. The Scottish Government have repeatedly claimed, indeed the Deputy First Minister did so again today, that the test takes less than uh, an hour per pupil. Indeed, I think I heard the First Minister say it was an average of 20 uh, minutes. I can find no teacher who confirms uh, that fact. In a class of 21 primary one pupils of varying abilities, the average time, I understand, is an hour per pupil. Not 30 minutes, not under an hour, but an hour. And, uh, uh, yeah. John Swinney. Mr Scott is quite right to press on evidence and the government has 
um, either has answered or is about to answer FOI requests which demonstrate the data that is available which shows the average time for a P1 assessment in numeracy is 22 minutes and in literacy it's 27 minutes and that's across um, in excess of 100,000 individual assessments and that information is in the public domain. Tavish Scott. Well, we'll see, and well, I think all of us will cast a, a close uh, eye on that. I, I'm, uh, uh, average, I think, was the word uh, used, but uh, we'll, we'll be very happy. Uh, we'll be very happy to look at the, the look at the evidence on that. But all I'm saying to Mr. Swinney is, I have plenty of teachers, not just in Shetland, but all over the country, who time and time tell me again that the t it takes more than an hour for a pupil. And here's the point. It's not just the time it takes for the pupil. It's the time the teacher takes out of the classroom when he or she could be teaching the other pupils in her class. And I think that's the important point that the minister gave no recognition for in his remarks uh, earlier uh, today. Time that the teacher could be spending with 21 other pupils as opposed to taking the individual pupil bit by bit through that test. 22 minutes, 27 minutes, or an hour. Come at what it is, that is time not spent in the classroom. It is wrong, therefore, to underestimate, and I believe disparage the evidence of class teachers everywhere, that the time taken on primary one tests is time lost to teaching, and therefore to the educational advancement of those five-year-olds. Uh, testing five-year-olds also is particularly demanding on teachers in composite classes, many in many parts of Scotland, a fact that simply hasn't been recognised as yet by the government. So there are sensible educational arguments why this P1 testing regime is not appropriate and should be stopped. The principle of the argument does not support testing five-year-olds anyway, but the practical case against testing five-year-olds is overwhelming. I am at a loss to understand why the government are deaf to the practical observations of teachers and parents. The language ministers have used too uh, to su suggest that anyone who even considers that P1 testing is wrong has been extraordinarily aggressive. Many teachers have asked me why is that the case. There are sensible educational alternatives that help primary one teacher judgment in their constant evaluation of their class. Why, for example, don't ministers instead listen carefully to teachers using the Northern Alliance literacy program? It is constructive and it is helpful. It helps teachers with their pupils. As one uh, teacher put it to me the other day, why doesn't the government embrace and support the things that work and help us rather than imposing tests on us that don't tell us anything about our class that we don't already uh, know. What is the government's case for testing five-year-old uh, girls and boys? Is it about the data they want? One of Mr Sweeney's officials has helpfully explained today that uh, how school league tables could be calculated using the data from these tests. Mr Sweeney made much of that today. It looks to me like the remorseless direction uh, of travel. Tests are not appropriate for primary one girls and boys. The government should accept that and should accept the will of this parliament. We now move to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes, please, and time is quite tight. Uh, and I have Murdo Fraser followed by Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate on P1 testing. And I do that from the perspective of someone who has two children in primary school today and someone who's also married to a primary school teacher. So what happens in our primary schools is of keen personal interest to me as all obviously being of wider political importance. And the starting point for this debate is to make it clear that we on this side of the chamber do support standardised assessments as a matter of principle, as Liz Smith set out. And I know there are other parties here who take a different view, and we've already heard from them uh, this afternoon, but our position is that there's great value in standard assessments further up the school. These assessments can be of value to individual teachers, they can help parents in understanding what stage their children are at, and equally importantly, they can give an overall picture of performance across the whole country. Now, we've heard the Cabinet Secretary set out why he believes standardised assessment is important. I have sympathy for his argument, and indeed agreed with a lot of the points he made. But this does fly in the face of decisions which were taken by him and his predecessors in office in order to reduce the amount of information that was available. The Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy was scrapped. Scotland was removed by Mr Swinney's predecessor in office from the International TIM study, that's Trends in International Mathematics and Science study, and PEARL's Progress in International Reading Literacy study, which provided an important comparison with other countries. So if the government is going to make an argument today about the value of assess assessment, it needs to be consistent in its approach, whereas it's been completely contradictory to what it's done in the past. 
But this debate is not about standard assessments in themselves. It is focused instead entirely on this one question. Are standard assessments appropriate at primary one level? And here's where we depart from the Cabinet Secretary. Because the evidence we've heard from those involved in education, and particularly from teachers in the front line, is that there are real issues with the standard assessments for primary one as they exist. We know that the EIS opposes these tests. We've heard, uh, quoted already in this debate this afternoon, evidence about the views of various teachers and head teachers expressing concern about the impact that these assessments have. And we've also heard the views of many parents deeply concerned about these tests to the extent that many are looking to actively remove their children from the system rather than face testing. And Liz Smith has ever set out in some detail her concerns with the inappropriateness of this form of testing at P1 level. And I cannot see why testing like this is necessary. Because any primary one teacher worth their salt will, within a few weeks, if not indeed days, of new pupils starting in school, have a very strong grasp on their individual abilities. It is precisely because we have well-trained and committed primary one teachers that we should have confidence they are picking up those children who are doing well, those children who are struggling and those who will need additional support. And it's very difficult to see, therefore, what a standardised test, as is being currently set out, will bring in terms of improving the information available to a good primary one teaching. Because, in fact, the primary one teacher should know this already. And the reality is, if these tests are already proving controversial, if they're already proving unpopular uh, with parents, as is the case, what we're going to have is a situation where large numbers of parents effectively boycott these tests by removing their children from the system, as they are entitled to do. And so the value in these tests disappears altogether. There's not a large majority of parents and pupils participating. So the policy objective is defeated because parents vote with their feet. In approaching this issue, the Scottish Conservatives believe we should listen to the evidence. My colleague Liz Smith said earlier, we did say in 2016 we would support P1 tests, and we now accept that was wrong. We've listened to the evidence, and we've changed our minds. We realise we got that wrong. In the same way we heard from the Cabinet Secretary for a year, more than a year, about how vital his new education bill was going to be. The First Minister even told this Parliament last year, and I quote, a new education bill will deliver the biggest and most radical change to how our schools are run that we have seen in the lifetime of devolution. And yet, one year later, it's been announced that this bill will be abandoned. So what the Cabinet Secretary seems to be telling to us is it's all right for him to change his mind about the way forward, but when other parties change their mind, they're not permitted to do so. That seems an extraordinary set of double standards, even for this government. And the Cabinet Secretary went further because he used extraordinary language this afternoon. He accused the Conservatives of deceit because we changed our mind. He should be apologised for that remark. John Swinney. I didn't accuse the Conservatives of deceit for changing their mind. I accused the Conservatives of deceit because Liz Smith said on the 28th of August the Scottish Conservatives had never been in favour of formal, standardised national tests. And Murdo Fraser, in his hysterical speech, has just confirmed, has just confirmed that very point. Murdo Fraser. You know when Mr Swinney's in trouble, presiding officer, he resorts to the language we've heard uh, this afternoon. You see, he's allowed, he's allowed to change his mind, but when other people change their mind, they're accused of playing politics. They Can know they're on the run, presiding officer, on this issue. Can we please settle down? That was just getting ridiculous on both sides of the chamber. And can you please close fairly quickly? I please, will, Mr. Mr. Can I just say this? There's actually much in the SNP's approach to education we support. Many of their ideas about improving school autonomy, empowering head teachers, or putting a renewed focus on literacy and numeracy ideas we've championed for years. So, in our approach for education, we can hardly be accused of putting politics before the interests of young people because our track record speaks for itself. So this vote today is not a vote about party politics, as the Cabinet Secretary would claim. It is a vote about what is best for our schools, 
is a vote for what is best for our pupils and what is in the interests of parents. And that is a vote not to have standardised testing at primary one because the evidence tells us it is not in the best interests of our children. And for that reason, I support the motion in Liz Smith's name. Now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've listened with interest across the Chamber this afternoon, hoping I would get some enlightenment as to the positions of the parties regarding national testing. And I'm afraid uh, I remain as confused as I was before uh, I came to the Chamber this afternoon. Um, a bit of reflection on my own experience. My son went through 5 to 14 um, curriculum. Um, I was provided with report cards for him every year and it would state that he was working towards a particular level at 5 to 14, um, including at primary school when he was working towards level B. And what that told me was that he was working at the appropriate level, but also that he had been assessed by the teacher formally as part of that process for that. And that was happening from primary one. I then discovered that there were other testings going on of pupils across North Lanarkshire at that time. I had never heard of them before, the CAT testing. Um, um, that my, my son was um, undergoing. And um, murder phrase, I talked about parents um, voting with their feet. I wish I'd had that option because actually I knew nothing about that. It was hidden to parents. We weren't given any information about when this was happening. We weren't given any information about the results of that testing. It was completely um, a, a black box in education. And um, uh, having done my own research on it, I decided as a parent that I thought I listened to the um, arguments for the assessments and realised that they were probably to my son's benefit and I made that decision. But that was not apparent to most parents. What we have now is a system that parents know exactly what is happening in their schools. They can get the results and they can see um, um, a, an assessment of how their child is doing and that is much, much more transparent than what was happening before. No, I'm sorry, Mr Gay, I, I don't have enough time. Um, the, the other thing that concerned me as a parent was um, the cost of these tests and, and it's been mentioned today that somehow uniquely the tests that have been brought forward by this government cause extreme stress and extra time and extra um, resources for the classrooms and it's taken up all this time um, but actually um, you know there's been no assessment of what happened before with the other testing that was going on so I'm in the dark about this no no I won't be taking uh, an intervention thank you um, so when looking at this, I, I remembered um, uh, that um, there had been some work done on the costs of national testing. And in uh, June 2005, the test, uh, Times Educational Supplement Scotland, had done a survey of local authorities. And um, 32 local authorities had found that standardised testing was costing councils over a million pounds a year. And the true cost of the Scottish Bursa was likely to be higher because Dundee and Free Scalloway, Clint Manager and Stirling hadn't responded to those FOI requests. Other local authorities, including Glasgow and Perth and King Ross, didn't disclose their costs because they carried out testing on a school by school basis. So did that come out the school budget? Did it come out the education budget of the local authority? I'm none the wiser. Tests also showed that it was on the increase. North Asia had been looking um, for a, a, an authority-wide approach in order that they could inform their assessment of how their learning and teaching was happening in that um, a, um, local authority. Of course, that was a labour-controlled local authority, and they would be carrying out assessments in P1, P3, P7, P7, P5, P7, and S2. So um, a labour-controlled authority, but they would come today and say that they don't agree with primary one testing. Edinburgh City Council was the biggest spender on standardised testing, paying out £136,000 a year on literacy and numeracy tests. They used GL assessment tests and an own P1 baseline assessment to examine pupils' literacy. So again, a Labour Council in coalition using P1 tests. And at that time, Lindsay Patterson commented on some of the, the issues around testing, and he said that the testing... What, what the survey showed from tests was that testing was not alien to the culture of Scottish teaching or the Scottish teaching profession. But instead of buying in the, from the likes of Durham University and from external organisations, um, tests without benchmarking across local authorities or across Scotland, we now have a standardised <coughs> test that can be used um, by, by everyone uh, and across um, Scotland as a whole. 
Um, but I can just point to some of the councils that were doing this. Edinburgh, as I said, Labour and Coalition Primary One testing. West Lothian was spending £100,000 a year. Again, Primary One testing, Labour-led led council. Aberdeenshire was spending £98,000 a year. A Conservative and Lim Deb Coalition, Aberdeen City, was using £95,000 in tests. Again, a Labour, Labour and Conservative Coalition. Yet the Conservatives are coming here today and saying they don't believe in primary one testing. Either the opposition parties are completely unaware of what their own administrations and local authorities are doing in their classrooms, or they have come here only to have what the First Minister... Ms Adamson's closing. What, what Mr, the First Minister des described as political opportunism. I don't find either of these positions particularly edifying, presiding officer. I don't think it serves the young people of Scotland to be having this debate in this context when this has been a standard practice. If there are improvements to be made, let's make them. But to have a fundamental position against primary one teaching when that has been going on in our schools, then we should, should be looking to improvement and should be looking to what the benefits are for our young people and not just taking a political stand to um, you know, s serve some purpose against the government because it doesn't do the, the young people of Scotland any good and it doesn't do this parliament any good. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, it's just like being back in the classroom this afternoon. Uh, today's motion states good quality pupil assessment is an essential component of the drive to raise educational standards in Scotland schools. So I would like to begin with a note of consensus because the exhausting stalemate of political debate surrounding Scottish education needs it because our teachers deserve it and because for our pupils it is imperative that every political party focuses on the practicalities of closing the poverty related attainment gap. But perhaps Professor Lindsay Patterson put it best last week when he said the simple fact as unpalatable as that might be for many politicians and teaching unions is that education can't do without tests. Only reliable data from scientifically standardised tests can enable us to learn from both the failures and the successes. Assessments, call it what you will, are not new. In the senior phase of our curriculum, we expect pupils to be ready to sit final examinations at National 5, higher and advanced higher level respectively. Assessment, I'd like to make some progress. Assessment is a golden thread running through our education system. As a child progresses, their, their teacher assesses their progress and our teachers have always been entrusted to do that. In Fife, this has been completed in our primary schools historically through Assessment is for Excellence, developed by Durham University. But across the country, as my colleague Bruce Crawford alluded to, 29 out of 32 local authorities use some form of standardised assessment to benchmark pupil progress. So we know this is not something new. Under, assessment under Curriculum for Excellence, however, changed in its very nature, and what might have been an end of unit test in S4 became an outcome and assessment standard, which pupils had to overcome in order to gain unit passes and therefore to be presented for the final examination. If a pupil did not pass these units and an added value unit or a National 4 or an assignment at National 5, then they could not gain full course awards, mm -hmm. and in some circumstances they would not be permitted to sit the final examination. The Education Secretary was therefore right to remove this unnecessary administrative burden, which meant faculty heads like me, with responsibility for a number of different subject areas, would be sitting in school until late into the evenings simply to input data for the SQA's benefit. This, for me, is the issue with today's debate, because it has taken primary one assessment as a narrow indicator, as something which can be detached from a child's wider educational journey. I would therefore ask that the government give consideration to how standardised assessment data correlates and communicates with the Managing Information System, or CMIS as it's known, which is used by most secondary schools to track pupil progress. Presiding officer, I doubt there is a single member of the Scottish Parliament who has not sat a test in their lives. They're integral features of a modern education system. Indeed, on the Education Committee, I am glad to be in the company of two former teachers, and across the chamber, I count at least five others in total. But I think I am correct in asserting that I am the only former teacher with experience of actually delivering curriculum for excellence and of the many challenges and opportunities that system can present. Now, what existed prior to standardised assessments was, of course, the much lauded by the opposition Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy. As a faculty head, this data was never shared with me. As a classroom teacher, I had random groups of pupils removed from my classes and then returned during the course of a lesson. But as a Secondia Education Scotland, however, I learned the most about what SSLN meant. 
administration running about providing data to the government of the day. This has to be the key difference with standardised assessments. At yesterday's briefing with Scottish Government officials, it was explained to all members who actually attended that data generated by these assessments is then provided to the teacher to track pupil progress accordingly. This data is going to mean something to teachers. I'd like to make progress. Notwithstanding, I do think that there have been legitimate concerns raised regarding how standardised assessments will be administered. I have consistently raised poor ICT provision in our schools as an issue from my own experience. A primary teacher I know told me of having to sit one-to-one -one with one of her pupils to administer these assessments. Why? Because there was no Wi-Fi connectivity. Yesterday, my surface decided to give up the ghost whilst preparing my speech for today. In minutes, a member of the Parliament's IT team was in my office and within the hour, I had a new one. That doesn't happen in our schools. Wi-Fi is often disparate, technology provision patchy. We must therefore support our teachers in making these assessments work and that means local authorities need to ensure they resource our schools on an equal basis. Presiding officer, last Thursday I watched a class of school ch children look on as the leader of the opposition party berated the educational system in which they are currently learning. Yeah. I watched her pivot a question on standardised assessments, the role of parents in directing school education. I watched her hype up a narrative which has again been perpetuated today to suggest that Scottish education is failing. Today's motion appears to be much of a confused muchness when it comes to the Tories on education. We know they themselves back standardised assessments in 2016, but today's motion pivots play-based learning, and really, I have to wonder if any of them have actually been in a primary school recently. Or are they seriously suggesting we allow pupils to, up until the end, or are they seriously suggesting we allow pupils up until the end of SD to play in sand pits and paste, paint pictures with their hands? Presiding officer, to conclude, I hope every member will reflect upon the purpose of assessment today. We all sat some form of assessment to get here. And if we are to have an education system which provides an equal chance for every pupil to succeed, then we must empower our teachers to make the necessary interventions which will do just that. Thank you. I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate, although I didn't feel particularly if it is a debate at this stage, and I hope at a later stage people will be willing to take interventions. In opening, can I express my concern at the way in which those defending the Scottish Government position have dismissed the issue by suggesting that it's all got up by those who are motivated by opposition to the SNP? We ought not to judge others by your own standards. It's all, it is, of course, to take this line is a well-known tactic to impugn the motives of those raising concerns, for then you do not need to address the concerns themselves. In doing this, members have shown great disrespect for those parents, teachers, educationalists, childcare workers and others who have had the temerity to suggest that the Scottish Government approach is seriously flawed. And I do suspect that many of these people, including primary school teachers, have been in a primary school in the last week or so. And can I say to John Swinney, it's the oddest of attacks I've heard him make, that his criticism of the Tories is that they're simply not being Tory Absolutely. enough. May I also express concern at the attempts to characterise the debate as between those who care and who want to bring rigour through rigor standardised testing and a teaching profession that does not care and simply resist change, whatever that change may be. All my teaching career, I was driven by a passion and desire to see rigour in the system, a rigour that ensured that children, wherever they were born and whatever their circumstances, could achieve their potential. I always believed the education system should raise ambition and expectation, not shrug a child's life chances away on the basis of where they were born. And that is the test I apply to this policy. Will it improve those chances? I do not believe it will. And I say this to the Cabinet Secretary, teachers who oppose this testing do so not because they don't care, but precisely because they do care. Teachers want real change in the lives of young people, not something that creates a busyness in a system, but with no evident benefits. So to the test themselves, I attended the demonstration, loosely called, yesterday, and that raised a whole series of questions for me. The assessment can be taken at any time over primary one, so children could be take, doing the test at any time between the age of four and a half and over six. 
There was no clarity on the level of support a child could get to complete the assessment. A teacher might help them. Additional support teacher might help them. Indeed, a buddy from primary seven might help them. But there was going to be no consistency it suggested on that regard. Pupils were to get loads of practice ahead of the assessment so that they understood what the questions might involve. So it was clear, despite claims to the contrary, that the assessment is not consistent, cannot be used as a survey of national trends in literacy and numeracy, and is not just part of the normal learning experience. In truth, it disrupts that experience. But as Ian Gray said, our short experience of a rather shambolic lunchtime presentation is not what is relevant. What do teachers, what do families tell us? Teachers tell us that it takes up teacher time and takes time away from learning. That is taking classroom support from, ind from individual pupils who need it to manage the class while the tests are being run. That the information the test provides is less useful to them than the assessments they themselves make. That there is huge effort, but to little or no purpose. It's no wonder that those who are in the front line of supporting our young people are so frustrated at the approach of the Scottish Government. And it's hard to assess the opportunity costs of this focus. Not only does it not support learning, it compounds the pressure already on teachers and support staff. And even if the assessment produces a diagnosis, a diagnosis that most teachers will already have been able to make for themselves, it will not bring with it the help the diagnosis identifies. identifies. So, you fund a test, but it will not bring extra learning support to help a child catch up. It will not bring the educational psychologist to assist more complex needs. It will not bring a home links teacher for the wee soul whose family circumstances are denying the child peace to learn. It won't bring the additional support for those with additional support needs who need help to sustain a full day or a full week in school and are currently on part-time tables. It won't reduce workload. It will disrupt it further. While you want to do more on, on testing, Mr Swinney, you are reducing the support that staff and teachers have in the classroom every day. And this is the nub of it. Standardised assessment is not a policy developed over time and building consensus around its worth. It started as a line to take when government was under pressure on its record in education. And the problem for the Cabinet Secretary is that in seeking to answer the question on how to improve Scottish education, he does not follow basic good practice so revered in the education system itself. Look at the question, study the evidence, draw conclusions and then outline action. Don't start at the conclusion and then work your way back to find a way of justifying it. That is poor practice in education. And it's even poorer practice when its consequences are so significant for the education of our children. It's time for the Cabinet Secretary to stop the defence that he's deployed so far that he's the only one who cares. It's time for him to step back, not dig in. Listen, build consensus, change his approach and ensure that our young people are at the centre of this process and that none of them are denied the opportunity to a proper education. James Dornan, followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, President Officer. If we want to get it right for every child, then we must ensure that we catch each individual at least by the time they reach their first moments of education. As a constituency MSP, I deal with many inquiries about education provision and outcomes. Often parents tell me stories about their children's abilities and trials. When they've identified a difficulty with their child's ability to learn, they frequently tell me that they wish it had been picked up earlier in order for that child to have received the support necessary to enable them to reach their own unique potential. And I've, met a parent who's complained about early, I've never met a parent who's complained about any early intervention when it comes to supporting a child's educational needs. You see, presiding officer, parents recognise that the earlier a problem or indeed a talent is identified, the more support and educational nurturing that young person can receive. Education doesn't just start in primary seven or at NAP five level, or even when young people are sitting higher. A good education starts with a firm foundation from the very day our children cross a school door and before. The standardised testing is not a mark of the educational destination that a child will arrive at in the future. It's merely a process in which education providers can gather the appropriate information and data to ensure that no child is missed out or left behind. Teachers need a benchmark to gauge the abilities and attributes each child has or needs in order to succeed. And it really is important to acknowledge that these assessments form only part of the picture when it comes to the progress of a child's development. 
Yes, of course I will. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Deputy President. I'm interested to know whether the member thinks that these tests actually show what he's uh, saying they do, because many teachers feel that they give a, a, a benchmark that they can judge themselves, but it doesn't tell them anything about the individual's potential. Okay. James Dornan. Well, I, I sat the test today, and I'm proud to say that I passed first time. Uh, th thank you, thank you. Uh, but I've seen it. And we've got a four-year-old in, in our house regularly. And there's lots of the questions there that I think at the start of that process that that four-year-old, he's not four yet, he's four very soon, that that four-year-old would have been able to do. And it's an adaptive test. And if, the, if that was the limit of how that child could have... But hold on, hold on, let me, let me finish answering your question. And if that's the limit of, of, of what that child could have achieved, that's where the test would have been, and that's what they would have known. But if the child is doing well, then you can, you can get harder and harder questions until you find the level where the child is at. It's an adaptive, and, and it's no way a pressure test. I mean, I hear about children crying and they doing these tests. Children have always cried at school. Primary school, I remember, I rem well, hold on a second. I remember the day I started primary school, one girl started crying in the corridor, and the next thing there was a corridor full of greeting wains. Because you're young and anything can set you off. So please don't mix, don't mix the two together with the tears of a child being about to test. No. No. It really is important to acknowledge that these assessments form only a part of the picture. The assessment has no results and is used alongside many other teaching tools to provide a more accurate and complete picture of developmental progress. The government's always made it very clear that these assessments are a guide to creating a tailored and specific education for each and every child. And they're in no way, shape or form a negative tool. And just like I mentioned earlier, they should be used to identify any early intervention necessary. I read a brilliant article in the Herald which argued that we take the politics out of this debate and highlight why it's so important that we look at this debate rationally without engaging in the scaremongering which can be so damaging when parents are already faced with so many difficult choices when it comes to raising children. The discussion around what's best for our children should fundamentally be with their best interests at heart and not used as some sort of political football. And to be quite honest, this seems like just another Tory and Labour stunt. The Conservative Party are known for many things. Not many of them positive, but at this moment in time, their party mantra seems to be U-turn above all else. We've seen, we've all witnessed through spectacular 180 when it comes to Brexit, but this current change in her party policy is quite something to behold. Not only does standardised testing appear to be a policy which the Tories agreed with, they were for once publicly supportive of this government's commitment to it. Liz Smith herself releasing statements to the press, criticising previous structures of testing and encouraging the Scottish Government to improve the very assessments in which this motion deems to criticise. It does smack of opportunism and blatant hypocrisy. And I think we've all witnessed the Tory party's ability to use pretty much anything to attack the SNP. However, I'm shocked at their willingness to take something as important as a child's education and use it to serve their own personal agenda. When I was convener of education, I worked well with Liz Smith, and I have the highest regard for her. And I know that she's a genuine interest in the future of children and, and all our young people. And for that reason, I'm incredibly surprised by her putting her name to this motion. I would strongly urge her to reconsider her position on this. We should be using this platform in the chamber to draw together when it comes to closing the attainment gap. It's angered me that we're using this valuable time to discuss an issue which has been supported by parties across the chamber. Now, I'm sure Labour and the Lib Dems will be saying where. I was on the television just before I came in here, and I was on with a, a Conservative and a Lib Dem, and the, both of them were saying these tests are the worst thing in the world, and they're, they're going to be the ruination of every child. And yet, four councils have got Lib Dems and Conservative coalitions, and the four of them are using standardised testing. Four of them were using it beforehand, and four of them are using it now. We have the Labour Party over here, who use it everywhere. Everywhere they're in power, the Labour Party use standardised testing. It's not the testing, you, the assessments you don't like. It's not that. It's not even the standardisation of it. It's the SNP bit at the end of it that you don't like. And that is the terrible thing about this debate today. Because this is not about child's education. This is not about the, the assessments. This is about trying to get one. It's about people smelling blood thinking that they Mr. can get Dorn a victory, when what they should be doing is they should be concentrating and making sure that every child gets the education that they can and gets the start that they, be, they deserve, and that's right in primary one. I support the amendment. Can I again remind members they should always speak through the chair, and I call Alison Harris to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 
I'm delighted to speak in this debate this afternoon in support of my party's motion on this important subject. There is a clear role that assessments can play in the drive to raise educational standards. However, the contributions from my colleagues that they've actually made so far have actually made it especially clear why we must support the motion calling for a halt to P1 testing. They have highlighted the significant educational evidence that underpins the need to halt these assessments at the primary one level. What has been introduced for primary one children sits very uneasily with the play-based philosophy of early years provision set out in the curriculum for excellence. My colleagues have also demonstrated that this debate is of such importance, not for political reasons as we've heard more than once today, but because this debate will impact in the lives of four and five year old children, the youngest and potentially the most vulnerable children in our education system. However, it is not only those young people who have been impacted by the botched implementation of standardised assessment at the primary one level, their parents have also been affected. Yep. And that is who I will focus on today. Parents should not have to fight for accurate and transparent information about their children. When they request information from the Scottish Government about the assessments their children are undertaking, the response should be clear and correct at the very least. If you just let me continue for a minute, please. Looking at the timeline of Scottish Government interventions in this prolonged conversation on primary one testing, it is obvious that this has not been the case. Firstly, Scottish Government documents did not make it clear if parents could withdraw children from these assessments. Then, emails released under Freedom of Information legislation revealed that a Scottish Government civil servant said, and I quote, children can be withdrawn. Weeks later, a Scottish Government spokesperson said there is no statutory right for parents to withdraw their children from any aspect of schooling other than from some parts of religious education. Finally, a civil servant misquoted advice from SOLAR, the Society of Local Authority Lawyers in Scotland. This organisation publicly refuted the government's statement. Looking at this series of messages, who can blame parents for being confused when this SNP government contradicts itself on a weekly basis? Yeah, sorry. Alistair Allen. I thank, thank the member for giving way. Uh, she's mentioned quite rightly about how parents deserve information. Can I ask her how she squares the need to give parents information about how their children are doing with her preferred option of stopping assessments which have been in place for a number of years? Alison Harris. Well, I, I really feel that we have a very professional teaching, uh, you know, teachers, and they are actually very capable, in fact, more than capable of assessing children and giving the information to parents on a daily basis that they require. The Cabinet Secretary's apology to Parliament for the last error was welcome, but it does not change the fact that this level of confusion is unacceptable. Hard-working parents do not have time to decipher muddled messaging from the Scottish Government. And on a topic as paramount as their children's education, they simply should not have to do so. Parents should not encounter political spin when they ask about their children. It is little wonder that opinion of school, local schools was at record lows in the Scotland's People's Annual Report, a Scottish Government publication released two weeks ago. In 2011, 85% of people were very or fairly satisfied with the quality of local schools. This has now dropped to just 70% in 2017. Under the SNPs, parents' confidence in schools is plummeting. And yet, only this week, the Cabinet Secretary appeared on the Sunday Politics to say that he may not respect the view of Parliament on today's Scottish Conservative motion. Well, I sincerely hope that that will not be the case, and I shall remain hopeful until proven otherwise. Because parents, teachers and organisations, from Upstart to the Scottish Childminding Association to the EIS, are giving the Cabinet Secretary a clear message. It should be play-based learning, not tests for primary one children. Not tests for Scottish children at an early age when many European countries they, they would be, well, they wouldn't start for up to two years, their formal education. 
whilst five-year-olds in Frankfurt and Florence are happily enjoying the play-based learning of kindergarten, we have five-year-olds in Falkirk having to face the pressure, stress and anxiety of standardised testing. The clear message that parents and education professionals are sending the government is shared by those on this side of the chamber. It is also shared in the principles of the Scottish Government's Curriculum for Excellence. By continuing with these assessments, the SNP are disregarding the guidelines within their own documents. That can only add to the confusion for parents and teachers who are already struggling to cope with the excessive bureaucracy and workload that has been foisted on them by the SNP's handling of the implementation of the Curriculum for Excellence. It is time the Cabinet Secretary listened. He is aware that we in this party are behind him on the principle of standardised assessment in general, but going forward there are two things that have become Ms. clear. Ms Harris is just closing. Firstly, these assessments cannot continue for children as young as four, and secondly, quite simply, parents must be treated better. In conclusion, I would like to quote the words of the Executive Director of Connect, Eileen Pryor, who said, whether they are called national tests or national assessments, whether the Scottish Government said they are tests or they aren't, it's time to scrap them for P1 children. Thank you. Maureen Watt, followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, for affording me the opportunity to speak in this debate, which, as Claire Adamson said, from some contributions has been more heat than light. It is the fact that nearly everybody feels qualified to speak in education because they've obviously been through the education system themselves and may have children or even grandchildren more recently in our education system. My own interest in education stems from my mother teaching primary one or the reception class for many years, having worked myself in the sector both at secondary and college level, having chaired my children's primary school parent council but most importantly and relevant, having driven forward the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence as Minister for Schools and Skills from 2007 to 2009. An education system which we should not forget is world leading and which many educationalists across the world are watching with interest and envy and adopting elsewhere, not at the moment. As we've heard already, primary one testing is not new. 29 of the 32 local authorities carried out this testing prior to the introduction of national assessment. As Lindsay Patterson, Professor of Education Policy at Edinburgh University, a not infrequent critic of government policy said, the simple fact is, as unpalatable as it is for many politicians and teaching unions, is that education cannot do without tests. Only reliable data from scientifically standardised tests can enable us to learn from both the failures and successors. Professor Patterson's words, presiding officer, not mine. Joanne Lamont. Issue about the 29 local authorities who do testing. I've actually been involved in these testing. They bear no comparison to what has been described now. But would an, an option be for there to be discussion through the HMI with the three authorities that don't have these kinds of assessments and that they could have, decide what kind of assessment it would be and whether it's appropriate or not in the way that it was done? Maureen Watt. Well, I was just going on to say, presiding officer, that um, if we didn't have nationalised, standardised testing, it would, of course, be left to local authorities to do their own. And then the opposition parties would be complaining about a lack of consistency and lack of standardisation and a postcode lottery. The opposition parties are keen to try and find evidence on early years testing. The truth is, presiding officer, I really don't think there's much of that out there. I did find one relating to kindergarten in the US, where it begins by saying that there is a long history of screening children in kindergarten for sensory, language and cognitive abilities in order to refer children with disabilities for early treatment. It goes on to say, students who do not perform as expected on the assessments can be classified at risk and teachers can alter their instruction. It might be good if you just listened to a, 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 to, to, a, to a paper on this particular issue. Students who do not perform as expected on the assessments can be classified at risk 
Mr. Johnson, it's, sorry, Ms. Watt, could you halt for a moment? It's quite clear, can I say, Mr. Mundell and Mr. Johnson, that Ms. Watt is not giving way. And that teachers can alter their instruction to help ensure that students are learning to read and not falling through the, clark, the cracks. Early detection can deter later reading problems. It says with intensive intervention, student ages 8 to 10 could increase their accuracy in reading but could not catch up in their fluency rate. So 8 to 10 is already too late. In the US, kindergarten are encouraged to, quote, use assessment to inform instruction with the end goal of increasing student achievement. So, Cabinet Secretary, I've not had one single constituent contact me on the issue of P1 testing. But what on earth do I say to the constituents who come to me to say that their child's possible autism has not been picked up? and addressed, or their AHD, or their hearing difficulty, or their sight difficulty, or their dyslexia, or any other conditions, because the opportunity in P1 tests has been scrapped because of a blatant politicking by the opposition parties. This has nothing to do with our children and their future, and getting it right for every child, and having individualised learning plans, and raising attainment, and giving every child an equal start in life but everything to do with the kind of negative, even destructive opposition of the Conservatives in this current Parliament. Today they've been called out, not only as being, interested, being uninterested in the well-being and education of our children, only those who are growing up in loving, nurturing surroundings are fit and healthy and thriving, and not at all interested in identifying those children who are struggling, struggling because they've not had their, that nurturing environment, or are hungry because of the Tories' disgraceful welfare policies, or have experienced too many aces in their lives, which is in inhibiting their concentration and ability to learn. Today, we see the Conservatives are all over their place, all over the place, as their hypocrisy is called out. Previously, they were all in favour of tests. Last week, it was scrap the tests. This week, it is suspend them, or the test is too difficult, or it's not telling us enough. Which is it? And only five or six members took the time to go and find out about the tests for themselves. Cabinet Secretary, these tests no, have not even had a year's run. Of course, they should be re reviewed and refined if necessary, but do not kowtow to these disgraceful ch chancers that surround us in this chamber. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, I'm going to take a bit of a deep breath. This was not the way I was planning to start these remarks, but I think there has to be a correction and some of the statements we have just heard. It is simply a mistake, a mistake to confuse assessments of neurodevelopmental disorders with testing. They are completely and utterly different things. We need to be building understanding on neurodevelopmental disorders, not, not blurring the boundaries between different categories, because that is not going to help those arguments, not going to help those debates, not going to help the understanding that people with dyslexia, with ASD, with ADHD need in, in terms of getting the help they do. And I would argue that these tests are a barrier to those things, not helping. Now, if I could identify one question alone. One of the questions in these tests is, what sounds like this dot, dot, dot with a picture of a feather? Now, I would argue, if you're a child with autistic spectrum disorder or with dyslexia, perhaps the ADHD, you would find that question in particular hugely stressful difficult to answer. You'd be left confronted and confused with what you were meant to ask. And don't tell me it's all right because it's a multiple choice question. These are five-year-olds who've never had to sit a multiple test choice, a uh, multiple choice test in their lives before. So don't tell me it's straightforward. And let's not confuse diagnostic tests with academic tests of, uh, for literacy and numeracy. Now, what I was wanting to say in my remarks is that I think it is important that we look at the merits of these tests, what they are aimed to do and how they do that within the context of the education system that we all want. Now, that's not party political. 
That should be about having a dispassionate debate, an objective debate about what role these tests have in general. But more importantly, and I think this is important in terms of this debate, specifically, what role can they possibly play for five-year-olds in P1? Because I think that's what's at the heart is there's been too much blurring also of the general to the particular. Uh, the arguments around the generalities of testing, having to make sure that children do get used to testing, and then the specifics of P1 testing. And I would argue that the two are very different. But I speak on, in this debate from that perspective, not as a politician, but as a parent. And I had to learn a bit of my own lesson the other day when, and this was a fantastic opportunity, one of pride, when my daughter, who's six, just gone into P2, who did sit the test last year, and by the way, we didn't find out about them in advance. But when she, for the first time, read her own bedtime story, I didn't read her the bedtime story, she read me it, and she did it with passion and with joy. She you know, read the words which were not all straightforward, such as enchanted, it was Cinderella, uh, and other words such that, with, with, with uh, intonation and with a pleasure, which meant that I saw that her education was working. I didn't need a test to tell me that. And what's more, a mere matter of weeks before, and this is where the lesson was for me, I was worried about whether her reading was up to scratch or not, whether or not we had to spend more time and attention with her at home trying to get her up to speed. And that would have been wrong because the value of her education at this point is not about the precision with which she reads, it's with the, the passion that she reads, the enjoyment that she gets, and the fact that she finds it useful for her own life. That's what for a five-year-old should be reaching in primary one, not arbitrary academic standards, which is for such, something much later down the line in terms of their academic careers. But it strikes me that testing at this point is counterproductive in far more fundamental ways. Because if we believe in curriculum for excellence, if we believe in the philosophy it was meant to enshrine, it's about trusting teachers, allowing them to design the curriculum that's relevant to their communities and their children. This doesn't do that. This is putting arbitrary, centralised tests, which ultimately teachers are always going to, test to uh, teach to. And we do not want teaching to the test, not least of which in the early years, when we ought to be encouraging learning through play. And I fail to see how testing for literacy and numeracy using multiple choice tests is compatible with learning through play in any conceivable way. But what's more, I think it stifles innovation. And I know the Deputy First Minister is passionate about ensuring that we engender a culture of innovation in our education system. And I agree with him on that. And indeed, again, one of my personal lessons is seeing the value of that innovation, which we've seen in my daughter's school, where they have combined the nursery and primary one. They, they don't have fixed classrooms or fixed teachers through the day. They have uh, embraced play through learning, and they have combined the approach of the nursery and primary one. I fear that if you impose tests such as this, that ultimately it will make teachers fearful of innovating like that because they know that they are going to be tested and they will be fearful whether or not those uh, innovations are simply not worth the risk. But ultimately, we do need to learn the lessons from elsewhere in the world. And I think Ross Greer set out the case and the lessons from Finland very, very well. And it is clear that high-performing education systems trust their teachers. They pursue a less centralised, less prescriptive method and they, 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 they uh, trust the professional judgments rather than uh, testing in order to assess children. Uh, briefly, I'm right at the end. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that Mr Johnson has time. He has to wind up in the next 30 seconds. So this is the, the direction that the debate should have been taking this evening. Not about what party said what and when, or whether or not you could find a press release or a speech saying something or other. It's whether or not tests are helpful for our five-year-old children or not. That is the substance. That is what's at stake this afternoon. That's what we should be discussing. And let's ignore the rest of this political flim-flam and nonsense. And I think it's very clear that if you, if you have any, if you are serious about the education of our five-year-olds, testing them can play no part in their school experience. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm afraid I uh, bring probably the least experience and relevant life uh, to this debate of anyone so far. Uh, three years lecturing to postgraduate students doesn't qualify me as a teacher, that's for sure. I'm not a dad, so I have nothing there. But on the other hand, I have nine great nephews and nieces, a goddaughter, and seven nephews and nieces. So I've got some exposure to it. And 
just picking up on Daniel Johnson saying, you know, a multiple choice test to be stressful. Well, believe me, I've found it quite stressful standing beside my, my uh, goddaughter when she was not yet three with uh, a Portsoy ice cream shop uh, <laughs> gift voucher in her hand and we were experiencing the multiple choice between the 32 brands of ice cream that there were there as we went through and made choices. Actually, that illustrates, I think, a general point that developing skills starts very early. And by the time you get to five, I think every child has gone through many multiple choice examinations. They just aren't in the academic sector. There's nothing under unfamiliar about being presented with choices. Now, I just give that as an illustration of how we may all be guilty of overplaying uh, some of the issues that there are here. I also, in early stage of the debate, but it's been uh, remedied later, in particular by Alison Harris, uh, the early speakers made comparatively little mention of the children. And I think we should put the children uh, at the uh, centre uh, of uh, the debate, uh, rather than perhaps putting the teachers at the centre of the debate. But clearly the teachers are not unimportant, and neither uh, are the parents. Uh, that's uh, for absolutely uh, sure. Uh, but, presiding officer, the real thing that there is in this debate uh, is the Conservatives to change their mind. And they are entitled so to do. I have occasionally changed my mind. And my political colleagues have occasionally changed uh, their mind as well. There is nothing wrong with that. If new information comes along, then new conclusions can reasonably uh, be reached. But the real question is, what is the Tory position uh, about testing overall? And that takes me back to my intervention uh, on uh, Liz Smith at the very first uh, contribution to this debate, because south of the border, they are moving in a very different direction, uh, the Tories. The new reception baseline assessment will be statutory for all pupils in England from September 2020, and that is for the reception class. In other words, at kindergarten before you get to primary school, but it's also coupled with testing in the first year of primary school and testing in the second year of primary school uh, south of the border. Now, the National Foundation for Educational Research uh, has said our experience in producing a reception baseline demonstrated it's possible to undertake a robust assessment of children's language, literacy, and numeracy, numeracy skills at this age. In other words, four, five, or six. And I think we should hold on to that expert advice. Indeed, they go on to say it's vitally important to the lasting and significant change that parents and teachers be provided with transparent and consistent information. And that's what the Tories are introducing in England. Um, they've bluntly tried to disconnect the Tories in Scotland from that and take a different position. Uh, but it is one Tory party, so I'm not at all clear uh, on what basis we should properly look... Yes, Ms. I will. Smith. Mr Stevenson, I have to say there's a, lot of there's a lot of opposition to the concerns of what's happening in uh, south of the border for exactly the same reasons that there are concerns up here. Stuart Stevenson. It's quite interesting uh, that the Tories, therefore, I have a confession here, I think, that the Tories are getting it wrong. Well, if they're getting it wrong in England, it's perfectly possible for us to consider uh, they may be uh, getting it uh, wrong in Scotland. <laughs> he will. He will. <laughs> no, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank Mr Stevenson for taking his intervention. In saying that perhaps we, we would take a different position to, uh, to, to, to what's happening down south, Mr Stevenson uh, uh, concede that perhaps you might be getting it wrong up here. Stuart Stevenson. I'm, I'm rarely accused of getting it wrong and never admit. Um, no, that, that of course is not true. I will always look at the evidence, but the evidence here is that like more in what, I have not had a single constituent con Set me on this subject. This is not the talk of the steamy. Among those for whom this matters, the pupils and the parents. It simply isn't. So that's the kind of evidence uh, that I have to say uh, is, is, is driving me. Um, I have to say, 
some of the debate has said that uh, children at uh, the age of four, five, six shouldn't be exposed to computers. Well, I have to say, I spent 30 years working in computers, but I find most six-year-olds are more adept at working their tablet than I am. So I don't think that's yeah, a particularly yeah. credible argument. In conclusion, uh, presiding officer, just one or two things. Um, even in Denmark, Local government wants to introduce statutory testing for three-year-olds in kindergarten. There are many different ways of looking at this problem, and I'm very happy to support the Scottish government's approach. Finally, testing is important. Would you like a driver in the road without a driver's test? <laughs> Call Michelle Valentine to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Michelle Valentine. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Well, this, this gets more and more interesting as it goes on. Um, like Liz Smith and, and my colleagues, um, I do believe that assessment is a key part of learning and education, not least of all so that we can ensure progress and understand where a child has got to, but also so that we have some degree of accountability in terms of our education system as a whole. But today isn't about that. It's not about whether we should formally assess our children during their education. It's about the value and appropriateness of doing so in P1. So the early eight years of education are about building the foundations of literacy and numeracy. And children need to develop that confidence in using language. And whilst I'm not always a cheerleader for Curriculum for Excellence, its early years positioning is about the holistic development of the child based on structured play. So this enables the individual child to broaden their vocabulary, develop more complex sentence structures, recognize patterns, and ensure that no matter what their starting point, they will be equipped to cope with the rigors of formal learning and assessment as they go through the system. So we know that children don't all develop their readiness for formal learning at the same age, and structured play has a huge role in contributing not only to that readiness, but also to the way in which the individual child will engage in literacy and numeracy later on, the very things that uh, uh, Daniel Johnson was referring to. Being able to access and understand information effectively is critical to our children's life chances and well-being. Now, most of us in this chamber aren't experts in education, and therefore it is incumbent on us to pay heed to both educationists and teachers. And whilst I would acknowledge that difference of opinions exist, there is increasing evidence and clarity from all sides that formal standardised tests in P1 cuts across the principles of a play-based curriculum. Now, I was one of the people that took the time yesterday to attend the event the Cabinet Secretary arranged to try out the P1 assessment and also to discuss with the project team the intentions behind it. And I do want to thank Mr Swinney for that opportunity um, because although I might have seen it in, a, in, a, in, in schools, it was really good to talk to the team that were developing it. However, and here's the big however, you may be a bit disappointed to hear that it only really served to confirm my view that the administration of the assessment in P1 does have little or, or no real value. First of all, the, the use of the term standardise I found really quite confusing by the end of the, the meeting. Um, because each child may be given the assessment in a different way. They could be given it alone, in a group, with a P7 buddy, with a teacher. It could be at the beginning of P P1, the end of P1, in the middle of P1. And of course, you've already got a potential year's age difference in the children in P1. They could do it by reading what's on the screen, or they could listen to what the, the screen tells them by pressing the button, or it could be read out by the person with them. And not every child would complete the whole assessment, depending on how difficult they found it. And whilst I can accept that the, uh, the, argument, the, the argument that the assessment shouldn't cause the child undue stress if it is administered appropriately, clearly there were considerable and are considerable resources challenges, both in terms of the time to, it takes to set it up, to administer it, and to wind up afterwards, and the facilities needed because many teachers have been telling me that they don't have the computers in their classrooms, the children have to leave the classroom to actually undertake the assessment for the first time. And there is a pressure. If you can't actually do all that in a very supportive way, there is a pressure on the child when they're doing it, an assessment for the first time. And unlike most, the, the design of most learning and development tools for that age group, there was no positive feedback or encouragement built into the process and there was confusion about exactly how the results would be used. 
We asked the questions and initially we were told they were just for the teacher and maybe the head teacher. And then later in the discussion, we were told it could create performance tables. And we've heard all of this said earlier. But we were also told that it enabled the progress of the child to be tracked. And yet it was made quite clear that the test can only be delivered once. Um, and actually the system blocks you out after that. So it can't be re-administered. So there's no way of seeing if the child has actually improved. So therefore, I asked, was it the therefore a baseline of the child's ability and I was told no it wasn't that either we were told that the assessment would allow the teacher and head teacher to understand where the child was in comparison to others and identify their strengths and weaknesses in their knowledge and understanding but when asked if a competent teacher could do this without the standardized test in P1 we were told yes but they might not have the, had the time to get to know the child in that level of detail and the test would speed things up. I can't say I found that terribly edifying because I do hope my primary one teacher will know my child or my, hopefully my grandchildren in time to come. And I, but the thing is, I don't doubt the Cabinet sec Secretary's sincerity when he said we need to keep this in some sense of perspective because what I do not want to happen is that young people come through education system, have an issue which is not identified early enough, when all the international evidence tells us that if you don't identify an issue in an individual at the earliest possible opportunity, it'll just get worse and worse. So I have to ask the Cabinet Secretary, these tests, do you actually believe that they identify the barriers to learning, such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, visual or auditory limitations? Because I think they're the things that needed to be identified early at B1. And actually, if we can identify and address those, then we would be making real progress. But I don't believe those are captured by these assessments. And I would welcome comment from the Cabinet Secretary on improving early access to assessment and support for these very real barriers. If Ms. Blanton could wind up, please. Okay. Um, in a recent BBC interview, you said you remained open to ways in which you could reduce the workload for teachers. So, and you said my door is very much open on this question to reduce the amount of bureaucratic burden that teachers feel they are facing. I would put to you, today is an opportunity to do just that by supporting this motion. Can I call uh, Gordon MacDonald and uh, we'll be the last of the open debate. We'll move to closing speeches after that. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, presiding officer. This debate should have been about making sure that teachers have access to good quality information to help them to inform their judgment about pupil performance. It should have been about making sure that parents have access to information about the performance of their children and the schools that they're learning. It should have been about making sure the right people have access to the right information about our young people in order to ensure that progress can be made to raise attainment. Instead, what I've witnessed is political parties willfully yeah. rewriting history. Yeah. A history where Labour, the Lib Dems and the Conservative parties have supported assessments in primary one. It is blatant political opportunism yeah. and that they're prepared to do this at the expense of kids' education is an utter disgrace. Yeah. Ignoring the political... Ignoring the political point scoring that's been going on, let me move on and actually talk about what's going on in our schools just now. Attending, no thank you. Attending the information event yesterday, I and a number of SNP colleagues heard that these assessments are only taken by children once, the school, once during the school year and there is no set timetable. The assessments do not have to take place at a set time of year, but when teachers and schools decide the pupils are ready. The assessments consist of around 30 questions, on an average take 27 minutes, but there is no time limit. The answers are multiple choice and get progressively harder or easier, depending on each individual pupil's ability. They are completed online and are marked automatically, saving the teacher time and allowing them to focus on teaching. Teachers get instant feedback from the assessments so they can provide the support needed for each child's numeracy and literacy development. Of course, no new system of assessment will be perfect. That's why the Scottish Government published the user review report on the 20th of August, 
on the first year of the assessments and have already made changes. A local teacher I spoke to highlighted that their school has a computer suite and this has meant that the pupils have to go to a separate, unfamiliar room for the assessment. That should be addressed. Ideally, children should be able to take the assessment in a familiar environment. But to call for a ban on standardised national assessment is not the answer. It's just short-sighted political opportunism. Presiding officer, in carrying out research for this debate, I came across an education department report that stated, and I quote, in primary schools, standardised assessment using local authority tests at the beginning and end of P1 in literacy and numeracy has been established for the last 10 years. No, thank you. The report then continues by highlighting that results of these assessments are used in many ways by schools and lists eight benefits, including to contribute to the identification of pupils who may require additional support and to support the process of monitoring pupils' progress. One thing I forgot to mention was that this extract is from the attainment report for the Education, Children and Families Committee for Edinburgh City Council, published in March 2009 regarding the 2008 academic year. The report highlights that standardised assessments have been used in Edinburgh schools since June 1998, and they continue up until the present day. Political parties in Edinburgh are so opposed to these standardised assessments that during the eight years Labour controlled the council, they made no attempts to reverse the, the policy. The Liberal Democrat coalition of 2007 to 2012 made no attempts to reverse the policy and the Labour coalition from 2012 to 2017 also made no attempts to reverse the policy that they themselves introduced back in 1998. But this hypocrisy by those political parties now opposed to P1 testing did not just happen in our capital city. Out of 32 local authorities, 29 councils already carried out annual P1 assessments. Councils where Labour, Liberal Democrats and Conservative parties were in administration. Not only did these councils already carry out P1 assessments, but many of them had two P1 assessments, one at the start and also at the end of P1. So why there was no issue when their own councils were carrying out P1 assessments but there is now. The only difference I can see, presiding officer, is that it's an SNP Scottish Government administrating them, and it saves councils £9 million a year. To suddenly claim that there is an issue with P1 assessments when an SNP Government adopts the policy nationally is insincere, and they should be ashamed of themselves. They have sought a chance to attack the SNP and have had no problem doing a 180 degree turn on their own manifesto promises and the policies that their own councils have implemented. It's disgraceful. But the matter, I'm in my last minute, thanks. But the fact of the matter is, presiding officer, when it comes to educating our young people, no party should be exploiting these issues for political gain. Nobody should be standing in the way of driving up standards in our schools just for the sake of some headline-grabbing political kickabout. But unfortunately, presiding officer, that's all we've seen from Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives today. Thank you. We move now to closing speeches, and I call on Mary Fee to wind up for the Labour Party to be followed by the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In closing for Scottish Labour, can I begin by thanking the Conservatives for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. I will be voting in favour of the motion to stop testing primary one children in our schools. And I do so at the behest of parents and teachers from across West Scotland who have contacted me in the last week and in the last few months. And let me repeat what Ian Gray said in opening the debate today for Labour. We on this side of the chamber have no problem with teachers assessing pupils. Teachers assess pupils' learning every day using a whole variety of techniques and diagnostic methodologies. 
and deploy their professional expertise to do so. Nor do we have a problem with the testing of literacy and numeracy. However, the idea that children as young as four and a half years old are being assessed in our schools is quite frankly absurd. For the Scottish Government to pretend that this is about assessing and tackling attainment is nonsense. And the range of evidence and opinion on this shows how out of touch the SNP are with teachers and with parents. A child born in late February 2014 would be sitting the same test as a child born in April 2013. Now, the age gap is nothing new in our education system. However, the development of four and five year olds can be staggeringly different, more so at that age than at any other age of primary or secondary school. Children in primary one should learn in a stress-free and welcoming environment with constant support from teachers and from support workers. Every hour the teacher spends on carrying out these tests is an hour that could have been better spent developing and supporting basic educational and emotional skills of our children. And, presiding officer, I stated at the outset that teachers and parents from West Scotland have been in touch with me over this flawed policy. Not at the moment. I'd like to make just a little bit of progress, please. I'd like to read out a few of their comments. One teacher in Renfrewshire writes that the best data on pupils is gathered by teachers while teaching through the formative assessment that takes place every day in classrooms. I believe that the Scottish Government have chosen not to listen to teachers and even their own expert advisors. These are the sincere beliefs and experiences of a teacher dealing with young children every single day. And at the heart of this debate lies a serious question. Why does the Cabinet Secretary think he knows better than teachers with decades of experience and better than parents who best know the well-being of their children. It is the blinkered view of the Cabinet Secretary that's causing this unnecessary damage in our schools. And instead of teachers teaching, we waste resources that are already stretched in carrying out useless tests of four and five-year-olds. And presiding officer, another teacher, this time from Inverclyde, contacted me to say four and five year olds are expected to sit at a computer for up to and in many cases more than an hour for each of three assessments. They are using equipment with which they may be unfamiliar on a Wi-Fi or hardwire connection that is not fit for purpose to engage in repetitive activities. This needs adult supervision, often taking classroom assistance nurture teachers, learning support teachers, and in many cases, management teams away from their normal duties. This then impacts on the rest of the school and on the workload of that staff. And for what? For a bureaucratic nightmare. Another teacher from Renfrewshire writes, as a teacher and an EIS member, I am contacting you to ask you to back scrapping these tests. In my own school, they have caused stress and upset both to children and to staff. Testing young children is not necessary. The data gathered is not useful. And these tests set children up for a lifetime of hating tests. If, Scot if Scottish teachers are truly going to get it right for every child, then scrapping these tests goes some way to doing that. And, presiding officer, these are staff on the front line of teaching, not sitting in a central government office. They know better than any member of the Cabinet, and I would ask the Scottish Government to listen to these voices. And can, can I just, presiding officer, I've got six minutes or seven. 
such so I'm very sorry, Mr. Dorn, and then I won't be able to take your um, in intervention. I, I would like to pick up. I wanted to make some progress in some of the comments that I wanted to make. I would like to, however, in the, the, the very few seconds I've got left, um, pick up on a, a, a comment that Mr. Dornan uh, made in his contribution when he said that children cry all the time and it's got nothing to do with tests. So, that's, that's, that's when, 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 a parent, when a parent says that the tests made their child feel sick and cry and that their child was crying because they were made to go on a computer and they couldn't use it to do the tests, that's not the supportive and nurturing environment that I want any of our children to be in. And if this Parliament votes today to halt this, the, the assessments for primary one children, then that's what this Scottish Government must do. And the Cabinet Secretary must listen to the voice of Parliament. Conclude if not, speech. it further tells teachers and parents that the Cabinet Secretary's arrogance knows no bounds and that the Scottish Government knows better than them. Do what's right for four and five Conclude, year please, olds and end this vanity project. I call on the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney. Thank you, officer, by thanking Michelle Ballantyne for the kind comments she made about my officials who put on the demonstration yesterday. It was, uh, I asked them to do that because I felt it would help to inform the debate and to give members the opportunity to interact in questions, and I appreciate her kindness in expressing comments about my, the way my officials interacted on that, that matter. Um, President officer, the, the, one of the points that John Lamont raised was that the government had not followed the evidence and had not made any attempts to build consensus in this debate. The evidence that the government followed was the evidence that we commissioned from the OECD when, in response to the information that became apparent about the fallen standards identified by the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy, that we invited the OECD to review Scottish education. And they said, as I set out in my earlier remarks, that there needs to be a more robust evidence base right across the system, especially about learning outcomes and progress. And it's on the basis of that evidence and advice that we acted to address these issues. Why did we address the, why was our response in relation to standardized assessment? And the response was because we already had 29 out of 32 local authorities undertaking some form of standardised assessment, albeit of different character around the country. And indeed, a 30th local authority, South Lanarkshire, were considering embarking upon a form of standardised assessment, but when they heard the government was prepared to address this issue, they held back until the government was able to put its approach in place. Now, Mary Fee has just raised a concern about, uh, from a teacher in Inverclyde about the uh, application of the computer-based uh, Scottish National Standardised Assessment. And she raised that comment from Inverclyde. Well, in Inverclyde, the local authority has been using an on-screen, computer-based, non-adaptive, standardised assessment for many years. The difference between it and what I've put in place is that Inverclyde Council have been applying that twice during primary one. So the idea that Scottish national standardised assessments have somehow been applied in a way that has fundamentally changed the way in which young people are assessed at local level, given that evidence I've just cited about Inverclyde, is, I'm afraid, erroneous suggestions to be made. Eh, of course. Well, I mean, I go back to the point I made earlier about impugning the motives of people who raise concerns. Could, do you have an idea why school teachers, parents and carers are expressing concern? If this is something that's been happening routinely all along, why are school teachers highlighting these concerns about these proposals? Would all, I, all, I, I, all not, colleagues please address comments to the Cabinet Secretary through the Chair? Cabinet Secretary. Sir, sir, I, I, I'm not impugning anyone's motives. It's not my... Well... Thank, I'm grateful to Mr Scott for his enthusiastic support for that remark. I don't impugn people's motives. I've got, I face a challenge here where Parliament is holding us to account about the need to improve standards in our schools. And when the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy came out in 2015, we were not able to identify where the weaknesses in performance were around the country because there was no consistent data, which is exactly what the OECD highlighted. Which is why 
we gravitated from 29 out of 32 local authorities undertaking different forms of assessment into a standardised assessment right across the country. And I think that's a pretty logical move. Now, John Lamont asked me about teachers, and lots of teachers have been quoted. Let me quote a teacher from the EIS survey. Data is incredibly detailed and personalised. Feedback will be very useful in looking for next steps. Some of our data showed areas of weakness we hadn't expected, and some showed strengths, especially in P1, that we hadn't expected. So, yes, we can all say there's feedback from teachers, but of course it varies around the, the country as to what people will say. Now, I, I've not, I, I hear people talking about um, my arrogance in this debate. I'm, I've, not, I've adapted and changed these assessments. I've not said everything's perfect. I went out last year and I commissioned a user survey and I commissioned feedback from practitioners and it led to significant changes in the assessments about the replenishment of questions, about improving question design, about updating the practice assessment, and about providing advice and exemplification on classroom management, and also in relation to establishing a P1 practitioner forum to hear more feedback from the teaching profession as we work through year by year on these assessments. And of course, the reason why we need to do that is to address the comments made by the president of the Association of Directors of Education who said the other day, we suffer too much in education from decisions being made too quickly. My ask is for politicians to pause and allow us time to evaluate the effectiveness of these assessments. If Mr Johnson wants to... Uh, Daniel Johnson. Just on that point and, and on uh, amending the test, I mean, I have very real concerns about the compatibility of these tests with neurodevelopmental disorders. Will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to get the tests assessed for their compatibility with uh, dyslexia, ASD and other neurodevelopmental disorders. But, but, but fundamentally, that you know, teacher judgment comes in here because 100% of eligible young people did not take part in the assessments. It was 94%. That is the teaching profession exercising the type of professional judgment that I would ask them to do to say it's not appropriate for a, young, a particular child to take that forward. Now, Mr Johnson, raised the issues of the connection and compatibility with play. And I understand the model of education he talks about in his, uh, in his child's school in Edinburgh. I'm very familiar with it. And that's what the Curriculum for Excellence is designed to do. But I remind Mr Johnson, it is play for learning. Mm -hmm. And at some stage, we have to assess the learning that young people are undertaking to satisfy ourselves that they have reached the early level, which will then give us the foundation and the platform for them to move on to first level. Now, the last comment I want to make, presiding officer, is this, uh, is in relation to the, some of the comments that have been made about the um, international advice and evidence. Pazzi Salberg, who is an eminent uh, global uh, ed educationalist who originates from Finland, a man for whom I have huge respect and whose writings I follow assiduously, said this this morning. P1 assessment in Scotland is not a standardised test. It is a diagnostic tool to support teachers' professional decisions and judgment. We were critical of high-stakes standardised testing in the International Council, not this one. Now that is the inter... I'm afraid Mr Gray will have to... He knows that I'm generous in my interventions, but I'm, uh, I've reached the, the, the maximum time I can speak. That is information from eminent educationalists that demonstrate the government has taken the considered steps to support professional judgment, and I ask Parliament to support those measures today. Thank you. And I now call on Oliver Mundale to wind up the debate on behalf of the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I didn't think after this morning's Education Committee meeting that I could be any more depressed about this government's attitude towards education than I've felt uh, through this afternoon. And I think it's pretty disingenuous, actually, for the Cabinet Secretary to get up at the 11th hour um, and, and, and give a very gentle, uh, measured uh, talk through of some of the points in the debate when he spent the last week uh, trying to shout down opposition. And every uh, single one of his backbenchers has adopted the same approach, uh, refusing to take interventions on specific points. We were promised a facts-based debate. Absolutely. James Dornan. Remember taking the me taking an intervention from himself, or is he just going to make things up as he goes along through the course of his speech? <laughs> Oliver Mundell. I remember the member taking the first intervention, not answering the specific point that I raised, and refusing to continue the debate 
and address some of the further issues that are, have emerged around these tests. I think it's very disappointing that we were promised a facts-based debate and instead we've spent most of the time politicking as, as usual. <laughs> I, I, I'm, very, I'm, very proud, I'm very proud to say that on these benches we are willing to listen, evaluate the evidence and change our mind. We're, we're, not in, we're, not in, we're not embarrassed, we're not embarrassed to listen to the evidence, to listen to the many voices in Scottish education and take a measured and appropriate view. We're not saying scrap uh, all standardised assessments. What we are saying is that primary one is not the appropriate point to start it. I think that the Cabinet Secretary would do well to listen to that, just as we've offered our support when it comes to reforming education. That for us is not some political uh, move or some calculated agenda. It's because we think that educational reform is important. We've been saying it and arguing for it for years. I think what we are seeing in fact... Yeah? Cabinet Secretary. Mr Mundell, understand the, uh, the degree of doubt that we would have in our minds about his commitment to educational reform. When last week his leader was asking for more information about schools and today the Conservatives are advancing the argument for less information about schools. Doesn't he see the natural inconsistency in the arguments the Conservative Party have been deployed and why many of us here believe that the Conservatives are just doing this for a political hit on the government? Oliver Mundell. And doesn't that point just say it all? The Cabinet Secretary... When you're, fin when you're finished, Cabinet Secretary, when, 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 you're, when you're finished, Cabinet Secretary, that point just says it all because the SNP start from the point of view, this government starts on the most important issue on the top priority from our, for our country of thinking that everything's about politics and positioning <laughs> uh, and, and gestures instead, instead of looking at the evidence. And on, on, the on the substance of the point, on the substance of the point, there is quite a considerable difference from asking for useful information that has an evidence base behind it and pursuing hell-bent at all costs a set of assessments that have no rigorous evidence behind them. And that's what we've heard. We've heard questions this morning. And I would have been much more impressed. I know Michelle uh, Ballantyne was impressed uh, to, to see the assessments. But I would have been much more impressed if the Cabinet Secretary ahead of this debate had made available to us the robust evidence uh, that exists to prove that these assessments work, that they tell us something useful, because what I'm hearing from teachers is that there are a number of fundamental flaws in the system that's been brought forward. Smart children are clicking on uh, random options in order to speed up the process of getting through the test. People like myself uh, who suffer from dyspraxia and dyslexia are finding that the tests uh, don't work for them, that don't assess their potential or their capacity. Uh, and I think it was quite offensive uh, and disingenuous to parents to hear some of the comments uh, from Maureen Watt, which I don't think have any evidence base. And as far as I'm aware, the study that she was referring to uh, was not actually about uh, the type of test that's been used in classrooms here in Scotland. And then, if we really want to get on to uh, politics, negativity and unpleasantness, I've had Marie Todd uh, shouting to me across uh, the corridor here throughout the debate uh, about, about Westminster and about what's happening in England and Wales. And I would like to afford her this opportunity, if she wants to take it, to, if we're having a facts-based debate, to explain to this chamber the different choices that have been taken in England uh, and Wales to, to those that have been taken here in Scotland in relation to the founding principles and the type of curriculum we choose to have. So forgive, me, forgive me for being sceptical when the Conservatives come to this chamber painting themselves as the champions for the children of Scotland. <laughs> and, and, and as the champions for upholding the will of this Parliament. Because this Parliament made it very clear, universal, universal credit order please order please the two order, please. Care, the welfare
welfare reform is sending our children to school hungry. What are your policies in the UK government on welfare reform doing to improve attainment in our schools, the poverty-related attainment gap, to give it its full title? Through the chair, please. Oliver Mundell. Order, please. Order. I, and there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's how we build consensus around education and have a facts-based debate. If we're going to have a facts-based debate, I will explain uh, to Marie Todd that in England and Wales, they've gone for a much more formal early years process based on knowledge. Tests are therefore assessing uh, the start of that formal education process. They, they've decided, rightly or wrongly for them, and I remind uh, the Scottish Government that education is devolved and it's been separate here in Scotland even since before devolution. And we managed perfectly well under previous systems without these assessments. And actually, 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 att 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 attainment in many areas was far better. So, Rather than digging in deeper and trying to uh, tell us uh, that evidence is on their side, it's time for the Scottish Government to start listening, uh, to, to slow down a little bit and assess whether or not their own assessments are working. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on primary one tests. We'll move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of a business motion 13975 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I would remind members that uh, under uh, a new procedure, any member can comment on these uh, business motions. They would uh, be best to do so by notifying the chair by three o'clock that day. Can I call on Graham Day to uh, move the motion? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Uh, does any member wish to speak against the motion? No one does. Uh, the question, therefore, is that 139, motion 13975 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 13977 on a stage one timetable and 13978 on a stage two timetable. Uh, does any member wish to speak against either of those motions? No, that's good. Uh, the question, therefore, is that motions 13977 and 13978 be agreed. So I have to call uh, Graham Day to move the motions first before I actually call the uh, vote. Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Day. Assuming that no one else still wants to speak against the motions, uh, the question is that motions 13977 and 13978 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 13976 on designation of a lead committee. And could I ask Graham Day to move the motion? Uh, moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time, and there are three questions today. The first question is that Amendment 13945.1 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend Motion 13945 in the name of Liz Smith on primary one tests, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 13945.1 in the name of John Swinney is yes 61, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 13945 in the name of Liz Smith on primary one test be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on motion 13945 in the name of Liz Smith is yes, 63, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 13976 in the name of Graham Day on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Point of order, Richard Leonard. I rise to make a point of order under Rule 817 of Standing Orders. Teachers told this government that these tests were useless and ministers ignored them. Parents told this government that they did not trust these tests and ministers ignored them. The Scottish Parliament has now voted to scrap these tests. Order, please. Ministers must not now ignore the will of Parliament. The government, the government must therefore bring forward immediate plans for its response to today's vote. So, presiding officer, I ask you how you will authorise that within the rules of this Parliament. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. Uh, the Parliament has passed a motion, that is the uh, resolution, therefore it's the will of the Parliament. There is an expectation that the Government will respond seriously to that resolution and will respond appropriately in due course. Uh, a further point of order, Joanne Lamont. I wonder, in um, discussions with the Government, will you reflect on the recommendation from the C Commission for Parliamentary Reform that was explicit in saying when the Government lost a vote, they should take it seriously and report when they will come back to the Parliament to say how they're going to respond to that decision, which, as Marie Todd mentioned earlier, is the important will of the Parliament. <laughs> Can I thank Ms Lamon for that point? Uh, as it happens, that particular recommendation of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform is under active consideration by the Parliamentary Bureau at the moment. Uh, it is also it is the Parliamentary Bureau which is the body through which the Parliament as a whole decides when issues should be brought before the Parliament, decides parliamentary business. So it will be for the Parliamentary Bureau to decide when this issue should be brought back. Are there any other four points of order? Thank you. That concludes decision time. We'll move on now to members' business. And the member's business is in the name of Donald Cameron on celebrating 10 years of BBC Alaba. We'll just take a few moments for members and the minister to change seats. <laughs>